welcome everyone to From the Ground Up podcast. And I would like to tell you guys a little bit about our Black Friday sale. We do have t-shirts available. And of course, t-shirts go to help us out on hosting this podcast. So thank you everyone who's bought shirts and have supported us. And um, we're really, really excited today for today's episode. We are going to be having on the legendary Mark O'Shea, as you guys know from Mark O'Shea's Big Adventure or uh, Doctor of Herpetology at University of Wolverhampton and as well as a curator. So we're going to talk all things reptiles today. So Mark O'Shea, first of all, thank you so much for taking out the time and being here. And uh, let's get going on this book that you just actually uh, put out. Yeah, nice. Thanks for inviting me on, Joe. Yes, The Book of Snakes, my sixth title and um, the largest one so far. Yeah, published not early October, I think. And I hear sales are going back. Nearly sold out in the UK. Oh, that's amazing. So are they available still in the US? They're available still in the UK from, from the big dealers that have bought in a lot of books, yeah, and they're still available in the US because um, there are two editions. Um, there's a the British edition's got a, a whitish cover and the, the it's a sort of dark gray blue on the US edition. And Chicago uh, University of Chicago Press are the US publisher, and um, they've got more copies. Yes, it is still available. I don't think they'll run out for a while, but I think we'll be looking to reprint over here um, in the new year. That's excellent. So obviously Book of Snakes seems very general and there's probably a lot to cover. So what can we expect inside the book? Well, um, the series of books, and this was the last in the series, there was the Book of Frogs, which you may have seen by Tim Halliday, who I'd co-authored um, the Dawn Kindersley Handbook to Reptiles and Amphibians with, and that also came out with the Smithsonian Field Guide and so forth. Um, there's There's been about 10 books in the series covering all sorts of things and they, there, there are two important factors about it. One, there's 600 species represented and that's the case in every one of the books and two, they're illustrated life size which gets difficult with snakes unless you're producing a very large book. So the snakes appear as a, if it's a big snake you get a, a portion of the snake, the head, um, and then there is a full size um, there's there's uh, the whole snake reduced in size um, alongside, and they're all on white. And the the um, other aspect is that they've got a, a similar design throughout the whole series. There's a distribution map. There's a, a, a notes at the top giving you distribution, um, uh, prey, reproduction, site status. The scientific name, of course, is there and um, then uh, maximum sizes and then there's then there's the general text and the captions of the photographs and, and a list of related species it took two and a half years to write and i had to start off by deciding which 600 snakes to choose now there are at this point just over 3700 snake species in the world and so i had to decide which 600 to pick, which is nearly one in six of all known snakes. And I wanted to go for diversity. So I wanted snakes with a lot of unusual habits, behaviors and so forth, and also from unusual places. So I was going from snakes on mountains, snakes on islands, snakes everywhere. I wanted to represent every family and subfamily, which I did. Um, I haven't quite represented every genus, um, there could have been possible, but no, it might not have been because some of them are so difficult to get photos of. And um, then I thought, well, what categories of because it's arranged um, in uh, taxonomically, starting the scolicophidia, the lion snakes, and moving through the the um, the shield tails and pipe snakes and pythons and boas and on and on, all the way up to the colibrids and 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 the uh, dipsidids, natricids, lapids, and viperids. Um, but the snakes fall into, I suppose, three basic groups. I wanted to put in some that are commonly kept in captivity, that people are familiar with, that they know well. They're snakes, if you like, and that's things like corn snakes and milk snakes and king snakes and so forth. And then obviously there's the famous 
dangerous snakes that people wanted would want in the book, and the black mamba and the king cobra and the typhans and things. They're in there. Um, and then I wanted to add a lot of snakes that even experienced snake aficionados might never have heard of that had passed beneath their radars. And I've had a lot of feedback. Um, I've had emails from Harry Green and Rick Shine, uh, both of whom are uh, they're two of the top snake ecologists in the world, and they both complimented the book. And Rick Shine said to me, there are snakes in there I never knew existed. And that's something I've heard from a lot of people who do know snakes. So it's well and good buying a book on snakes, but if you've heard of every species in there, what are you gaining? So I, I, I wanted to, something for everybody. And I'm hoping we achieve that. And the one hard and fast rule, we must be able to get a photograph, a good photograph, a publishable photograph of the whole snake. And from my list of 600, I only lost about 30 species and had to replace them because we couldn't get photos. So it was well-researched list in the end. I'm very wow, pleased. Seems very time consuming. And yeah. I mean, were these live specimens or museum specimens that were photographed? Oh, no, no, all live. I mean, I do spend a lot of time with my, up to my arms in formalin and alcohol with museum specimens. But this book was all live snakes, no, no dead snakes at all. Um, that's, I mean, I, I, my papers when I publish them, we've got pictures of holotypes of snakes that were collected in the 19th century and things like that. Yes, then we're photographing dead snakes as well as live. But no, this book, every single one of them is a live For snake. A okay, live. Yeah. So, I mean, commonly we skip over some of our fossorial species. Um, oh, yeah. I can find one that I, you know, a brand new one that I've never heard of before. So a lot of those ones. Uh, I've heard of a lot of them. I mean, there's there's got to be nearly 300 blind snakes in 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 the in the blind snakes, worm snakes, sled snakes in the five families. Um, the Tiflopidae, the uh, uh, Gerophilidae, the Leptotiflopidae, um, the uh, Xenotiflopidae, and blah, 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 blah. Um, oh yeah, uh, the Animalepidae. No, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of species there that people will not they they were hard some of those are really hard to get photos of in life and to confirm that they were what they thought they were i'm sure and i mean the one thing that is common with those species is that we don't have captive animals to draw from because they seem to be very hard to keep well, it. yeah yeah do you mean draw from to obtain yes these are largely well one of the benefits of being in herps for five decades or more is that I know a lot of people. And through Facebook and other things, I was able to call on all those brilliant herp photographers out there. And there are a lot of really good photographers. And if I said, oh, I'm looking for a photo of this, within 20 minutes, half an hour, people are throwing up names and making contacts. And the book would have been, couldn't, it couldn't have happened without for, I, I okay i've got 70 odd photos in there yeah but i wanted the best photos and those aren't always mine i recognize that fact um so i was off the best photos and so if somebody else had got a better one that's the one we want for sure and that's that's great that it kind of seems like a book that was kind of put together by the community more so because it took everyone's effort to it's kind great. of if you look at <laughs> Here's the British edition, UK edition right now. Let's just find the, in the back. Have I got the list? There's the acknowledgements. Can you see that? Although every single one of those dark names, that's a photographer. Wow. And what they contributed. That's amazing. And they got paid. Well, they're getting paid. <laughs> Not very much, but... People were keen to get their quite a few people said, Well, I don't want to be, but I just want to get one of the pictures in your book. No, we still get paid. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They were taking pictures of snakes, no matter if they're getting paid or not, I'm sure. Yeah, but photography photography is is an expensive hobby, and you do you do need to earn something back from it because you know the gear gets trashed sometimes. You you do need to if you can earn from your photography, it's a it's a it's a good thing. 
Did you, were you into photography? I mean, was it equal to your passion in reptiles or was it the reptiles that got no, you into photography? I like, I like doing photography, but it's a tool. Um, I, I, I photograph mo most of my, my most important lenses are my macro lenses, including one which will shoot down to 10 times life size, which I use for photographing parasites of snakes and things like that, or the heads of blind snakes. Um, so I, I don't, I've got one long lens, which I might use if I went on safari, but I don't go on safari very often. No, photography is a tool for me of what I do as a professional field herpetologist. And all the species that we find, I obviously photograph. Um, and I spend a lot of time photographing in museums. Um, I'll photograph a, a specimen the entire animal dorsal, the entire animal ventral, hopefully pinned out so that I can get the scale counts off them afterwards. And then I'll do close-ups of the head, dorsal, ventral, left and right lateral for scalation da da uh, data. So I can actually draw the heads later. So for photography, it's, it's, um, it's an enjoyable pastime, but it is a tool of the job. Absolutely. Now, how many species, I mean, have you coined at this point or described? Oh, not that many. Um, I've been on, um, I mean, always co-authoring with people because a paper is much better if you've got two or three authors on it, sorts out the wrinkles and working with colleagues. Let's see. Um, I've just had Toxicalamus Pomihani published this month. Um, Dr. Calamus, uh, Ernst Mayer, I was described in 2015. We described um, Cylindrophus um, suboccularis, a, a um, pipe snake, a couple of years ago, largely led by my German friends. Um, we've had a, uh, a gecko from um, Timor, uh, Cyrtodactylus silatus. Um, and uh, we've got another species we've got species steganotus coming out soon which i cannot name until it is published and of course i've just had a snake named after me by um the guys in germany at the university of marburg um and uh that i've worked with they called it cylindrophis shei and it's from boana island off the west of saram now what does that mean to someone who's a lifetime herper herpetologist well um, it's nice for it to happen while you're still alive I mean, the late lamented Joe Slowinski had about five species named after him, but it all happened after the event. Um, it's nice for him while you're still kicking and walking around. Um, yeah, it's it's that that's recognition. That's it. It is a nice feeling. Absolutely. Now. I mean, how much time, I mean, obviously we're talking a little bit about your field research. I mean, how much time do you spend in the field these days? Far less than I used to. Um, during the 80s and the 90s, uh, I would be away on projects for three, four, five months at a time. I spent seven months in the Amazon for the Royal Geographical Society up in Huraima Territory. Um, I did expeditions for Operation Raleigh, running her projects in Papua New Guinea, West Africa, Central America, and they were three to four months at a time. I was used to spending long periods away. I, used, um, I was sent to Papua New Guinea by Oxford University to catch elapids for venom research in the 90s, and that was like five months and a spell, largely working on my own at that time. But now... With all my other commitments and things, I, I can't put that amount of time into it, um, being away. When I was filming, I was away a lot. When we were doing um, Big Adventure between 1999 and 2003, you go, oh, my God, is it that long ago? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, let's see. I was away about 200 days a year. Wow. I'd come back from a, a film shoot which might be um, three films if they were half hours or one film if it was a, a one-hour special. And I'd be back in the country for about two to three weeks and I'd have dispatch rider come down and switch my passports and take the because they'd have got me getting my visas in one passport while I was traveling on the other one. I'd, I'd have to swap passports. 
and um, I'd go and do some voiceovers and things, and then we'd gather all the research up for the next one, be gone again. And yeah, that was uh, that was a pretty intense five years. That was. Wow. Now, I mean, how much did that get in the way or aid your research at the time? I mean, the film crew, everything like that. No, I mean, I was largely showcasing other people's research on virtually every one of those films. I either had one main contributor um, or I had a number of contributors throughout the film. And I was looking to other people's research. Uh, when we went to New Caledonia, Aaron Bauer came along. And like he'd been there 16 times at that point, and he knew the island really well, knew the country really well. And going looking for giant geckos, with he, he was the best person in the world to go, highlighting his research. And then um, when I was up in the North Philippines, I was with Skip Lazell, um, and he, he looking at flying um you know, Draco flying lizards. And uh, of course he described the species that was up there. So he was familiar up there. And when I went down Baja, California, who other, who else would you go with but Lee Grisma? So, you know, and, and many other luminaries. So I was highlighting, highlighting other people's work. My own research was really on the back burner. In fact, the only film that we did, which was touching on my work um, was um, Magic Man in Papua New Guinea in the second season when I was out looking for Papua black snakes and a New Guinea small-eyed snakes, Micropegizikahika, because they were my stomping grounds. That's where I'd been doing work through the 90s, and so was following my own trail. And that was that, that was the – I don't think I had a contributor on that at all, no. So that was me. But Now, what, what drew you to Papua? Um – Michael Rockefeller. He disappeared there. Right. When I was a kid, I had a shed at the bottom of the garden. And <clears throat> this is in the, the late 50s, early 60s. And in this shed, I would put up interesting news clippings from the Daily Express newspaper that my father took. And I had three full page stories stuck up with drawing pins. And one of them was about Michael Rockefeller, the heir to the Rockefeller millions, who was on a field trip on, in West New Guinea off the South Coast. And the little boat they were in, I think it sank, and he swam to the shore and he was never seen again. And his father, with all the money they'd got, They'd got people out looking. They couldn't get it, couldn't find him. And it turns out that he was most likely eaten by the Asmat people. And the fact that there were still cannibals in the jungle really, really fired up my fascination. I was already interested in snakes, and there were snakes in New Guinea, and there were cannibals. And there were two other stories on, on my shed wall. Another one was about an expedition to the Amazon. And um, it was a Royal Geographical Society expedition, I think. But this expedition, the leader of the expedition had gone down from the camp to the river, to the boats, to pick something up, and he didn't come back. And after a while, the deputy leader of the expedition went to look for him, and he found him lying face down with arrows sticking out of his back, and his head had been caved in with stone axes. He'd been attacked by a war party by, from an uncontacted tribe. And that gruesome and terrible though it was, that sort of drew me to going to the Amazon. And the funny thing was with that story is I was telling that story to the director of the Royal Geographical Society sitting on the, re the veranda um, of the research station in Brazil in 1987. And he, when he asked me what had made me want to go to the Amazon, I told him that story. And he said, Mark, I was the deputy leader of that expedition. That was my best friend. It was me that went down the trail and found him. So it had almost come full circle. The story that I'd read about, I was actually on an expedition with the person who'd found him, the, the, the guy. And the third story was about Guam. And I'd been there too to look at the brown tree snakes. And that was a story about Japs in jungle don't know the war's over. 
Second World War. They didn't know they, they were still there was there were um, still Japanese soldiers on some of the islands in the Pacific holdouts. Wow. They wouldn't surrender. And anyone of my age, and certainly anyone in the states of my age, will will know the stories of those. And so those those three stories really drew me that the world was still wild in places. So combining that with my interest in reptiles, that's why I wound up in the tropics and especially Papua New Guinea. Now, there's a common thread of danger in all those. Is it the actual danger or is it just how uninhabited the, the area seems to be? If I said it wasn't, that the danger didn't add a certain frisson, a certain spice to it, I'd be lying, wouldn't I? Um, why do people bungee jump? Because they want a close look at the ground. No, they do it because it's dangerous. I don't do it because my back's bad because an alligator fall on me. And so I wouldn't want to do it now. Um, we all we all do dangerous things in some way or other. And um, to be honest, expeditions in the 80s were much more dangerous than they are now. God, there's, there's so many creature comforts now. We've all got these things. I'll tell you about when I got tagged, my first rattlesnake tag. Back to the Royal Geographical Society expedition in Brazil, in Huraima territory, not even a state, in 1987. We didn't communicate um, by phones. There were, there were no mobile phones. Uh, there were no sat phones. There was no internet. We had a shortwave radio. Well, are the dials on? They go, and you have to attach to a um, a car battery, which it drains quite quickly. And this is like you see in the old forties movies, people talking and you know talking on the big handpiece and so forth. We had one of those on the research station, which was five to six hours drive time from Boa Vista, which is the territory capital where we had an office where we had somebody else with one of these phone radios and a phone for the outside world. And we used to um, do radio checks. They'd be at six o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the afternoon. And the radio check would last about 10 minutes and the two radio operators would talk to each other and they'd say, look, we've run out of beer. Can you send some on the next supply run? Or they'd say, we're sending two entomologists out. Can you get a room ready on the research station? That sort of stuff. So the radio would then be turned off and they wouldn't be turned back on again until the next time for a radio check. And I was, I was photographing um, a young um, tropical rattlesnake, um, Huraima, the Crotalus derisus Huraima, the one that's found in the savannas around there. I'd caught about six of them up to some of the size of eastern diamondbacks wow but I, this was a really small one fortunately because i was holding it in my right hand and i'd rigged my camera so that i could hold my camera in the left hand and fire the shutter and i'd be moving it in to focus to just to get the head photograph just the close up of the head detail when somebody said to me what are you doing mark and i said i'm just photographing ow i must have slackened my grip i got bitten in the thumb i dropped the snake naturally caught it again with the other hand boxed it but i've now had a bite from a rattlesnake and the first thing you instinctively do is look at your watch half past six 20 minutes after the radio has been turned off yeah. and 11 and a half hours before they're going to turn it back on again they can't even tell the outside world that I'd been bitten or a, a range of medivac for 11 and a half hours. So I've got to survive this through the night. So we did observations, monitored the swelling, did all the necessary important observations. The nurse, we got a nurse on the station and we'd got a fridge that didn't work all the time with five, I think it was five, five packs of Butantan anticrotalico, Butantan Institute, Butantan rattlesnake antivenom. But because the fridge didn't work all the time, this antivenom was not crystal clear. It was mm, cloudy, and no Western hospital would administer it. They'd throw it away. 
but we thought we've got that in reserve if we have to use it. And I was doing pretty good through the night until about three o'clock in the morning when the venom seemed to start winning and the swelling started to advance further up my arm quite rapidly. And once it got past my elbow, that is an indication for antivenom. And so the nurse drew up the antivenom. She put it into a polyfuse, into a drip with 50 mils of normal saline. And um, she introduced it via the drip line into my arm. And I had a lot of unpleasant reactions. I had gum boils come up in my mouth. My scalp got super sensitive. It was really, really painful. But the worst of the lot was I went blind. I don't mean black blind. I mean white blind, like snow blind, like a television with no aerial blind. And I don't know if this is for 10 minutes, 10 hours, or forever. I've lost my vision in the jungle. And so I told her, and I was also having a bit of breathing difficulty. I told her, and she, she stopped the drip, and she gave me a big dose of adrenaline, and everything came back to normal, and my vision came back, fortunately. But I still need the antivenom. So that was started again, but at a slower infusion rate, and I didn't react badly to it a second time. And then I seem to be doing much better, but I still need to be off the island. This is an island, this is an island in the North Amazon, in Horaima. It's called Il Maraca. It's to the north um, west of Boa Vista. The river divides and comes together again, and it leaves this island, which is 100,000 hectares, and it's a, it's a reserve, and we're the only people on there. And um, at, at six o'clock, the radios came on, and they were able to alert them in Boa Vista that I'd taken a, a bite and that I needed to be medevaced. And so that was put into action. And they stayed then just bringing car batteries to keep the radios going so they could maintain communication. And at about eight o'clock, we got a call to say that the, there was an aircraft had been dispatched. So I was carried out of the, the um, dispensary, our nursing room, on a, on a mattress, which was put into the back of this old Jeg, which is a Brazilian Jeep, right? Which it's got no roof or anything. Just, a, just think of a cut-off Jeep. They put me in the back of that on a mattress. And they drove me down to the causeway, which is two kilometers. Then I was lifted out and I was put into an Amerindian dugout canoe, paddled across the Uraraquara, taken out of the other side, brought into this old Bandaranchi land cruiser, driven up to this fazenda. And the aircraft came in, came into land. All the seats had been taken out so they could mattress in there. And I was put into that and flown aboard Vista. Wow. And um, the one thing that I re was kept going through my mind was uh, something that a Brazilian herpetologist had told me, a guy called Celso Morata, who, who worked in Boa Vista. He said, if you get bitten, Mark, don't go to Boa Vista General Hospital. And I said, why not? He said, my friend was bitten by a rattlesnake. He went there. He told him it was a rattlesnake. They didn't believe him. And he spoke, he was a Brazilian, so he spoke perfect Portuguese. <laughs> Not my God, Portuguese. They didn't believe him. They gave him the wrong antivenom, and, and he apparently died a few days later. So I'm thinking, oh, right. I'm going to the worst hospital I could be going to. So I thought, well, I've had my antivenom now. And this is the 1980s. This is when the AIDS epidemic's starting. This is when people are talking about hospitals down in Latin America, boiling needles instead of throwing them away so you're thinking mm, this is not good so when they got me to the hospital i was determined that nobody was going to come near me with anything at all pointy and i put on this ward and they wanted to give me some drugs and a drip and no 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 and i my portuguese isn't very good it was probably a bit better then because i was working with brazilians but i found the best way to get my message over was to stand on the bed and ball my fists and threatened to punch anybody who came near me. And in the end, they gave up. They said, I'll leave the gringo alone and left me there. And I managed to get myself discharged the next day and 
two days later, I was back on the research station and they had a massive party. Wow. Now, was that first reaction, do you think that was like an anaphylactic reaction, uh, allergic yeah. reaction, or is it the antivenom spoiled? Well, it's, it, it's, it, was, it was a reaction. Um, it's uh, it was an early reaction caused by the antivenom not being um, top, top dollar, um, which set me in line for this problem I have had with rattlesnake antivenom subsequently. Um, like I've had Wyeth. Remember the Wyeth? I think there's a few people in the States who remember Wyeth antivenom. I had that a couple of times. And that's I've gone blind both times on that. So, so is it safe to say if you are bitten that you I mean, is do you wait it out? Do you try depending on what the No, 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 no. People do that and they find them dead on the end of the phone. No, if you have been bitten by something that is potentially lethal. You, well, I mean, you, you in particular, of course. Well, not, well, yeah, me in particular. Well, there are bites I've done nothing about, but because I've known that they, they weren't going to be serious. But um, to be perfectly honest, when when the King Cobra bit my shoe and I, all the venom got in my sock, and I took my sock off and I rubbed my toes with the sock, and I got rubbed toes, raw toes. That's how I got in venom by her, and I ended. I end. The, 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 I, I was still affected by the venom, and, and so I needed to go to hospital for that. The point is that people, why don't people, if people have got a, a venomous, li venomous snake license, or if they haven't, they often hold off on, on calling for help, and that can cost them their lives. To be honest, if you've been bitten by something that has the capacity to kill you, you should seek medical attention. You don't go, I'll wait it out. And, especially with the lapids. See, the thing about a lot of the vipers is they cause pain and swelling, and that tells you you're not doing so good. Whereas a lot of the lapids, the crates, bungaras, you might not even feel you've been bitten. People are bitten in their sleep and they don't wake up. They never wake up again because uh, those, some, those neurotoxins do not cause the pain. Pain tells you how well you're doing. If you've got a septic hand, you know you you need to get something done about it. This is leprosy, right? Leprosy does not make pieces of your body drop off. You know, leprosy stops you feeling pain when you're injured, and so you don't do anything about it. And then, of course, things decompose and drop off. Now, pains your friend. Always, always seek medical attention if you've had a bad if you've had a bad bite from a potentially dangerous snake. I think he's frozen. Oh, well. 